Amen, amen. Um, okay, before we get to the Acts reading, I've got some setup that I want to do with you. And so um, we're going to start by talking about Captain America. <laughs> because, right? Um, so if you're new to our church and you're waiting around for sports illustrations, God help you. They are not coming. Um, it's going to be sci-fi and it's going to be superheroes, really, for as long as you're here. So um, hopefully that's an encouragement. If not, hang in there. Um, but this is Captain America. Um, I'm very consistent. Um, this is Captain America. Um, one of the things that's so cool about this particular story for us today is that um, they do this thing where they're about to give little Steve Rogers there this magic serum that's going to make him into this super soldier, if you've seen the show. And uh, he's going to become Captain America. But the crazy scientist that's involved, you can kind of see his glasses, um, the crazy scientist involved isn't sure who he wants to give the serum to. And he starts with this, this principle of, you better have the character underneath before I give the power. Because if I give you the power and the character is not there, we're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to Steve Rogers here and he says, do you want to kill Nazis? Because this is happening during World War II. Do you want to kill Nazis? And his answer was, I don't want to kill anyone. I just don't like bullies. Mm -hmm. It's a great statement. Because what you're saying is you're not in it for the anger you're not in it for the violence. You're not in it for the ego. You recognize that there are innocent people out there being hurt and you want to protect them. That's good character. And he goes on to explain to him, he's like, you know, um, this, this power I'm about to give you, it amplifies what's ever already inside. If there's evil inside, it will be amplified. If there's good inside, it will be amplified. And there's a scene after that where like uh, Tommy Lee Jones plays the general and he like throws this fake grenade out onto the ground and everybody goes, um, you know, to save themselves. And little Steve Rogers, he jumps on top of it to protect and sacrifice himself. And so you can see it's not just words for him. It's down deep. His character is worthy of the power. So we'll start with that idea. And then we'll jump over into Genesis. The book of Genesis. And this is going to explain a lot to you about how the Old Testament unfolds. And how we get to this spot in the book of Acts. In the book of Genesis, if you remember, um, Adam and Eve, the first man, first woman, could do pretty much anything. There weren't a lot of rules for them. There was just one rule. And it's like they sprinted toward it to break it, right? <laughs> it's human nature. Um, so they go right after it and, and they sin like right away and, and they rebel against God. And, and when they do, when they rebel against God, essentially what they're saying is, hey, if there's a throne in my life, I'm going to sit on that chair. If there's a steering wheel, I want control of it. It's my path. I'm the one who's going to decide where I go. And that, that, obstinance, that stubbornness, right? Like, like it's in, not just them, it's in us, right? Because as the first humans, they breathed it into humanity. And, and when they did, they, they introduced all kinds of darkness for us. They, they, they introduced lies and greed and rage and violence, right? Like it goes on and on down through the centuries, down through the generations, and when they did that, God removed them from the garden. And here's the verse, uh, Genesis 3:22. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing good from evil. What if they reach out and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden. And some of you guys know the story real well. You know that God, God walks them out of the garden and says, you can't be here anymore. And then God puts an angel there with a flaming sword so that they can't get in. Well, why can't they get back in? Because the tree of life is there. And if they keep eating the fruit from the tree of life, they will live physically forever. And what God is saying is, listen, if you've got darkness in your heart, Giving you eternal life on planet earth is too much power for me to give you because you'll abuse it and bad things will happen. And just think through it logically. Like if they had lived forever or if any sinful person could live forever, what would they do with centuries and centuries and millennia of time to live on this earth as an immortal? 
Well, it's like they'd, they'd have the opportunity for endless education, for endless dominance of other people to give them military power so that they can continue to amass power and subject other people to their will. Like you don't wanna give long life, let alone eternal life to somebody who's broken, amen? Amen. It doesn't work. Let's give you another example. Um, After Noah's Ark happens and all of that, there's a scene in the book of Genesis afterward where some people get together And they discover, they stumble on the power of unity. And so they build this city. It's a place called Babel. And they build this great city and they build a tower in the center of it. And their ambition is that the tower goes all the way into the sky. And and, and, and they're able to do so much more than anybody else has done up until that point. Because they all got together and they shared the same goals. Unity is a powerful thing, yes? Yes. It's a powerful thing. Once we get our heads together about something, we can accomplish a whole lot together. But the problem was, is that it was all about their egos. It wasn't about pleasing God. It wasn't about being selfless. It was about getting a reputation and a name for themselves. And God came into this and said, this is going to end badly. And so what he does is he comes in and he confuses their languages, it says. And all of a sudden, everybody in this city that always spoke one language, they suddenly, miraculously, all speak a host of different languages. We don't know how many. And then all of a sudden, everybody has to leave the city. They have to find who speaks their common language, and they have to go and they have to make a new community and a new settlement with just those people. And so God divides them. Why does he divide them? Because unity is too great of a power for sinful people to hold. They didn't have the character for it. Now jump to Exodus and Mount Sinai. And I know I'm not reading all of this to you. I'm just giving you a background so you can understand. But when God's people, the Israelites, are uh, in slavery in, in Egypt and Moses goes and frees them, let my people go, right? And he frees them and they cross the Red Sea and they go to Mount Sinai. If you know the story, there's this, there's this moment where Moses and Joshua, so, so uh, Moses' uh, uh, assistant, Joshua, and, and Moses is fasting and praying this whole, like 40 days and 40 nights. You think your fast is bad. It's rough, you know? And he goes to the top of this mountain and it's, and it's fire and it's lightning on this mountain because the presence of God is physically coming near. And that's where the 10 commandments gets given to Moses. But there's this little moment where God tells him, he says, none of the people, the normal people, regular people, even though they're my chosen people, they can't come toward the mountain because they'll die. If they come near it, if they even touch the mountain where I am, they'll die. Why? Because you can't be near the power and, and the, the intense presence of God when the character on the inside is broken. It just doesn't work. And let's be real. He knew they were just about to make a golden calf and worship it, right? Like that's how the story goes. So God knows they're just about to lose their minds. They better not come here because it'll go bad for them. There has to be a separation We can't have eternal life. We can't have the presence and the power of God. We can't have unity. We can't have any of those things. We are limited. Some of you guys know the story of the temple. Even when God builds the temple, what does he put in front of the Holy of Holies? A veil. A veil has to go up. It's not a friendly picture, right? Like, I'm going to put a door in front of the presence of God, and the door's going to be closed. Because sinful humanity cannot come in. And that's reality. It's reality, but it's tragic. Do you feel the tragedy of that? For God to come in to us and to say, you cannot be trusted with too much. That's hard. We cannot be close because your sin is in the way. That's tough, right? Because there's something inside of us that we do want to be close to God. We want access to beauty. We want access to joy. We want access 
to wisdom and to love and all the things that are within God. And for him to hold us at arm's length, that is pain. Do you feel that? That's the Old Testament. See, sometimes people look at the Old Testament and they get really confused because they're like, it looks, it looks so different. It looks like there's a different God in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. And here's the thing. There's not a different God. Amen. There's a different humanity. There's an unredeemed humanity in the Old Testament. And God has to treat us that way. In the New Testament, something's going to happen. Amen. Amen. That's going to make things very different. Just one more tiny thing. Joel's prophecy. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. He says this, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. So Joel comes in and says, hey, all this stuff where like only Moses, only the kings, only the priests, only the special prophets, right? Like there might be one or two in the nation. They get to have the Holy Spirit. Nobody else does because we're all so broken. One day that's going to be different, he says. One day I'm going to pour it out on all men. Say all. 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 All is the operative word here. And this would have been a shocking prophecy for anybody in the Old Testament to read. And, and, and scholars uh, tell us that, that the Jews at the time, when, even when they're reading this prophecy and they're trying to understand what it could even possibly mean, because they don't know the whole plan of redemption that's about to unfold. What they guessed was, this was referring to the final day and the final judgment. That God would come in fire and everybody who is evil on planet earth would get blown away. And the only people that would be left would be the ultra holy. And that the ultra holy yeah, they'd all get the spirit. That's what they guessed was going to happen. But God had a different plan. So all that was set up for the Acts passage today. You doing okay? Yep. We're going to go read it right now. If you want to understand the magnitude of a good thing, you have to know how bad it was before. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Now, if you are here with us last week, we read chapter one and you saw that Jesus had, had died for us. He had risen from the dead. He had spent 40 days with all the disciples. There were 120 of them, right? And they were, they were um, meeting with Jesus for 40 days. He was teaching them. We don't know all the things that he taught them. But at the end of it, when it hit 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And then he said, you got to wait in Jerusalem. You got to wait in Jerusalem. Don't go build churches yet. Don't go start preaching yet. I need you to wait here. Have yourself a prayer meeting. Wait, wait, wait until the big gift comes. The gift of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what all that meant, but the gift of the Holy Spirit was gonna come. So they spent 10 days after Jesus ascended, 10 days in a prayer meeting. What's the longest prayer meeting you've ever been to? I'm guessing they got you beat right? You just got to wonder for a second, like on day two or day three, did anybody like God, you know, when's this thing going to happen? I just, I wonder. Anyway, verse two, suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. <laughs> You're welcome, sound guy. right? There was a sound like a mighty windstorm. He doesn't say it was a windstorm. He says this crazy sound filled the space and blew them all away. You're going to see in just a minute, the sound is so loud that everybody else outside who's outside at the time of this Pentecost festival, they all hear the same exact sound and they come running. That's how loud, that's how massive it is. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Say each of them. Each of them. Each of them. Nobody's left out. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. So he's like, it's, it's like a windstorm. And if, if you've read uh, the things that Jesus said before about the Holy Spirit, he talks about the Holy Spirit like a breath or like a wind. Actually, the, even the word in the, uh, in the book of Acts here in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit is pneuma, 
pneuma, which means breath or wind. It's not actually the word for spirit, breath or wind. And it's certainly not the word for Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, I I get it, guys. You know, like you go back a few hundred years and people use the word Holy Ghost. But for us growing up as kids in the church, that term kind of freaked us out. Yes? The pneuma of God came upon them. And they had these little strips of flame above their heads. Do you see the symbolism of God? What he's trying to say? Every single one of you, if all of us that are here today would have been there, you all would have gotten your flame at the top of your head. And God is saying, it's just like the pillar of fire in Genesis or in in Exodus, symbolizing the presence and the protection of God. Like it came over your head. You all get one. Like, and the tongue, you're about to speak other languages in order to unify people. And guess what? You couldn't unify people before. Because that was out of bounds, right? Like you didn't have the character to match that. God is undoing all the problems of the Old Testament. Do you see what he's doing? He's also tearing down the veil. And it says, and a miraculous power emerged. They began to speak in other languages. Why do they speak in other languages? Because of of verse five. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. What's happening here is that at that time, you would have people who lived in Jerusalem full time, but you would have all these people from all these other countries that had converted to Judaism as a religion. And there were three, the top three feasts of the year in the Jewish calendar. Pentecost was one of those three. So they likely would have traveled into Jerusalem to be part of the feast of Pentecost. They certainly didn't see this coming though. So they're all coming from these other countries. They love Yahweh, okay? They're devoted to Yahweh, but they grew up speaking a different language. And all of a sudden they're here and they hear their language getting spoken by one of these 120 disciples kind of blows their mind. Verse 12, they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other, but others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. There will always be people who can stare a miracle dead in the face and not believe it. It's it's always an option. There's a moment in the Gospels where um, Jesus is having this kind of moment with God the Father. And he says some things to God the Father. And God the Father talks back, which doesn't happen every single day, even while Jesus was there, right? Right? But God, the father thunders down from heaven and speaks to Jesus and talks about his glory and the way he's going to glorify himself through the, through the son. And all the disciples that are around there are like, this is amazing. God, the father just spoke out of heaven directly to Jesus. But there were some Pharisees standing there and they say it thundered. Because if you don't believe, you can keep on not believing, right? Right? So that's what happens there. Then Peter, verse 14, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. It's a funny moment for Peter. Like Peter does a lot of stuff really good. I'm not sure this is his best moment. Um, If it was happy hour, Peter would... Then you, I I don't know, like how that, (laughs) I'm just not sure it's the greatest counter argument, but he picks it back up in verse 16. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream, dream dreams. Why does Peter know this is the moment that Joel prophesied about? Maybe because Jesus told him in the 40 days. Maybe because during the 10 day prayer meeting, God spoke it to Peter and prepared him for all of this. Maybe he didn't even know. Maybe it's right there in the moment. And the spirit is not only filling them all with other languages, he's filling Peter with wisdom to understand what the Old Testament means. We don't know, but it's cool. 
It's super cool. Like he knows exactly what this moment is. And look at what he says. Like, like it's going to be on your sons and daughters. Your young men are going to see visions. Your old men are going to dream dreams. In the, in the one that we read earlier, he even talked about your servants and, and men and women. And so all genders are covered. All socioeconomic classes are covered. Like everybody is, everybody gets the spirit is what Peter's saying. And this is the moment that God had prophesied about. Okay. You're like, pastor, there was tongues in that passage. We're not going to talk about tongues today. I'm going to talk about it later. We're going to spend a whole Sunday really going after the concept of tongues. Um, I promise. Um, I will just say this briefly. Tongues is another word, kind of like Holy Ghost. that's a little bit unfortunate down through the ages with translations. The Greek simply means languages. They had a gift where they spoke languages. Um, at, there were, there were um, different translations that used the word tongues because it made sense for those people at that time. It became a traditional word in the church. And so a lot of times we just carry it forward. But for some of you, that word all by itself just kind of freaks you out. Amen. So it's, uh, and I agree with that too. For some of us, it's a very positive word. For other, others of us, the word can be a little bit scary. It's languages. It's a real gift. We're going to talk about it in depth. That's all coming. Today's focus is how can humanity su suddenly be worthy to be filled with God? When in all the Old Testament, they were not worthy. They did not have the character. You could not give them this power. All of the sudden, they are all filled with God. How is that possible? Jesus. Some of you have been reading. That's good. Jesus. Specifically, the cross. Specifically, when Jesus died on the cross. I talked about the door in the temple, that veil that was closed. Guess when it opened? It opened when Jesus was dying on the cross and said, it is finished. That's when it opened. And the scripture says that it was torn from top to bottom. And God was very, very clear, making it clear to anybody who saw it, the doorway is now open. And so Jesus opened the door to access to God. 40 days before the spirit fell, or 50 days actually before the spirit fell. 52. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, isn't that cool? Uh, sorry, I geek out on this stuff. I really enjoy it. Jesus died for us um, and he brought forgiveness, cleansing, and salvation. And he made us new. And he made us new for any of us that accept his gift and ask for his gift. It's what he made available for us on the cross, but we have to reach out and take it, do we not? And so even today, if you are a Jesus follower and you've reached out to him for salvation, and I know we're doing baptisms next week and some of you guys are all even planning to uh, be baptized because you've made that decision, that change has happened deep inside of you. If you have, you need to know that this Holy Spirit moment of being filled with God, that has happened in your life. Amen. That has happened in your life. And, and, and I know there's lots of teachers that are going to really finely slice the different ways that the Holy Spirit can come into your life, the, the ways that you can experience him, all that. I'm not getting into any of that. Later on, we will. But today, I need you to understand that when you became saved, the Holy Spirit came to you just like it came to those 120 in this passage. Amen. So there's a, there's a scripture that says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And what that verse indicates to us is that when someone gets saved, even though so much of it is spiritual and invisible to the human eyes, you get born again, to use Jesus's phrase. And in your rebirth, so much happens to you. You're almost like an entirely new Christian. Like if I could detect your spiritual DNA, it's brand new and different on the other side of that moment. And part of what changes in you is that the very spirit of God comes into your life just like it did those 120 in Acts chapter two. You get your own pillar of flame above your head. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so how can that be? 
What did Jesus do that changed things? So I, I, I need you to see how we can be filled with God the way that this says. So the first verse I'll give you if you're taking notes is Romans 8 verse 9. How can we be filled with God? But you are not controlled by your sinful nature anymore. You're controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember, watch this phrase. This is so important. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So he just makes it clear. He's like, if you belong to Jesus, you have the spirit. Right? He just says it. Clear? Amen. Jesus says you have the spirit if you're saved. I think that's massive. Also notice in there, it calls this Holy Spirit, it, it calls him the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God. Notice the synonyms there. If you study the, the uh, New Testament or if, or if this is part of your life group, you guys are studying Acts with us, you just need to know this up front. The Holy Spirit will be called by a lot of different names, just like Jesus is called by a lot of different names, right? He, he's the lion. He's the lamb of God, right? He's, 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 he's all of these things. With the Holy Spirit, he's going to be called uh, the Holy Spirit. He's going to be called the Spirit. He's going to be called the Comforter. He's going to be called the Helper. He's going to be called the Great Counselor. He's going to be called all of these things, but they're all him. And here he calls him the Spirit of Christ. And this is the one that's a little bit wonky for me. Because sometimes people talk about Jesus being inside of them. You ever hear Christians talk that way? I want Jesus to be inside of me. I want to invite Jesus into my heart. That's actually biblical. Because not only is the spirit of God in you, but somehow the spirit of Jesus is in you as well. You are never without Jesus. Amen. He is present with you. Now, whether or not it's the spirit that makes that possible, I, I don't know. The Trinity is a got a lot going on mystery wise. Amen. <laughs> but the spirit of Christ is in you. And I just love that. Back to that word, Holy Ghost for a second. Let me just say this real quick as a practical thing. If you have a complicated relationship with the Holy Spirit today, and many of you do, myself included, one of the things that can help you up and out of that complicated relationship is figure out how to pray to him right? Like if, if praying to the Holy Ghost freaks you out, stop calling him the Holy Ghost, right? Like call him my great helper. Call him my counselor because that's what Jesus called him. Like, like just, just tweak how you're praying and how you're addressing him so that you can address him. He is God, by the way. He is not a force. He is not just like, like the extra member of the Trinity, right? who we do not speak of. <laughs> we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like he is God. He is an equal power. He is an equal value. He's equal holiness. The, the Holy Spirit, address him. Um, Romans 8, 10, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. You have been made right with God. That's such an important phrase. Notice it's past tense. If you're a Christian today, you have been made right with God. You're like, but I still sin. Yep, that verse agrees with you. Did you notice the first phrase? It's like, you've still got sin in your life. That's why your body is dying. You've still got sin in your life. That's why your marriage is struggling and your family is struggling and your community is struggling. Like there is death coming into your life. Because of the sin in your life, for sure. But the spirit is there giving life. The spirit is there because you have been made right with God. That's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You are positionally right with God. So even though day to day, moment to moment, you sometimes kind of lose your mind and walk away from God again. Anybody do that? Even though you do that in the moment, the father still looks on you and sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ all over you. Hallelujah. He still sees his son, his daughter. He still loves you. He still sees you as perfect and without shame because that's the goodness of God. It's, it's something to wrap your head around. The next one, Galatians 5, 24. 
those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to Jesus' cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. This is, just, this is here for you just to kind of explain to you how this life with the Spirit works. If you are filled up with God, how is this playing itself out in your life? The way he describes this there is... When you come to Jesus, not only do you say, save me and forgive me, please, which that's huge. (laughs) We need to say that. But he says, also, you need to renounce your old life. That's a, that's a huge part. Like, and I love the way that he pictures it. He's like, take your old life and all your, all your old habits and everything that you've, you've kind of broken and ruined in your life, right? That, that past that you're kind of ashamed of. And he's like, and it's like, you're nailing it to the cross, of Jesus. Why? Because that's where he died and that's where I want my old life to die too. That's what he's saying. It's a picture of I'm done with that. I renounce it. It's what we envision in in baptism. It's like you go down under the water. It's a picture of you dying in your old life, dying. You come back up out of the water. It's a picture of you rising again to a new life in Jesus. It's the way it's supposed to work. And the spirit is a, a huge part of that. Romans 8, 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind, that leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind, that leads to life and peace. In this part, he says, you have a choice in every single moment, every single decision, every single temptation. You have a choice. You can let yourself still run things or you can let the spirit run things. Who's in control? And the more you let the spirit control things, the more things will get better. Amen? Amen? It's a choice. Okay, now let's go into the gifts of the Spirit, and I'm going to finish with these. Um, and I'm going to roll through these relatively quick. Um, here's what's supposed to happen to you. I'm just going to kind of run the ending for you. Um, I'm going to tell you all the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of these gifts, you're going to be like, yeah, I've been living the Christian life, and I've seen that stuff happen in my life, but I always gave Jesus credit for that. I didn't know the Holy Spirit was involved. And I want you to see what the third member of the Trinity is doing in your life and what a gift he is. Okay, so look at this very first one. Romans 8, 15. It says, so you, are not, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. See the new birth happening there? You got adopted as his kids. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So there's two really big things that the Spirit does for you. He eradicates fear in your life. How does he do that? He says, well, fear has to do with slavery. Fear has to do with the fact that I think God's got a clipboard and he looks at me like a servant and he's just waiting for me to do something wrong and evaluating my performance, counting my sins against me. No, you're his child. You're not his slave. The spirit is the one that tells us that. And so all that fear you've got of God, perfect love casts out fear, Amen. right? And the spirit has come to cast out fear out of your life. I love that. And then he gives you that spirit of adoption, that part of you that feels like, heck yeah, I'm a child of God. Heck yeah, I get to talk to my father any moment of the day and he will listen to me. The king of the universe will stop everything to listen to me. Why? Because I'm his kid. Amen. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. And that all comes from the spirit. He's the one that helps us understand that. Ephesians 1.13. The spirit is also God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance. That's heaven, by the way. That he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Ephesians 1.13. Sometimes people talk about heaven and they say things like, I hope I'll go there someday. Mm -mm. I hope I'll go there someday if I don't really screw it up in the next five years. No. If you are in Christ, you are forever changed. Amen. Right? Let God be true and every man a liar. You will fail and you'll keep failing. I'm not trying to speak negativity over you. I'm I'm trying to speak the greatness of the grace of God over you. He's enough. He's bigger than your sin and he's bigger than your failure. 
And so the Holy Spirit gets to come in and say, I'm guaranteeing you heaven. Crazy. So good. Um, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And this is Jesus talking. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus promises uh, power when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. He promises boldness in your witness, telling other people about God. And he promises great gifts are going to come. Supernatural gifts are going to come into your life as the Holy Spirit comes in. And we are going to spend a week also talking about supernatural spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. Next one, I got to hurry up. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, the human body has many parts. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves. Some of us are free but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit. So we will all share the same spirit. So what he's saying here is you are unified. Do you hear Babel here? You have unity church. God very specifically brought the Holy spirit to everybody, not just the really good Christians. And it doesn't matter what your background is. You all get the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it makes the church one. Yes. It makes the church one. And the oneness that the Holy Spirit gives us, the unity that the Holy Spirit gives us, number one, it's what Jesus prayed for. Jesus prayed that we would be one just as like he and the Father are one. But it's also an amazing power that is meant to be in the church because our oneness in the Holy Spirit is meant to transcend all the other identifiers that we give ourselves. When was the last time you looked at your Facebook profile and description of yourself? What describes you the most? I'm a child of God. In the kingdom of God. Part of the family of God. This is important. This is important. I'm going to come back to this next week. The reason I'm going to come back to this next week is we're going to talk about how the early church was of one accord. And we're going to talk about the power of their unity and the call to unity that's on us even today, even though we're not as maybe smart as they were. But we need to talk about it. We need to gaze at it. We need to look at it. Because guys, we're going into an election year. I don't know if you knew that. Do you feel the tension building in society all around us? The stress building? Culture is headed down a road of division. And the only way that we will unite and be together is if we find something that transcends all the divisions that are around us. That's a choice. I can't preach that one yet. That's next week. We're going to do that. Galatians 5.22 But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against these things. So um, the Holy Spirit, if he's acting in your life, if you let him control you and act through you, this fruit starts to come out. And you might be like, well, that fruit was there before. Well, hold on. These are Jesus-tinged decisions. Jesus-tinged words. Jesus-tinged actions from the motive of Jesus, delivered with the heart of Jesus, man, we weren't walking in that. And whenever you do, if you're anything like me and you have a moment like this where a Jesus action with Jesus heart and Jesus motive all of a sudden comes out of you, it feels like a weird day. And I say, thank God what just happened right? Because I can't do that myself. Amen. That is just as much a, a miracle as somebody raising the dead. <laughs> he brings fruit out of your life and then he changes us over time. Second Corinthians 3.18 and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like Jesus as we are changed into his glorious image. You are not stuck in your old ways. Everything that you've ever done and you don't feel like you're capable of change and all that hopelessness rises up in you, the Holy Spirit says different. He says you can change and he's gonna make you change. Last one, John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is Jesus talking. 
The Holy Spirit's the one who's gonna teach you. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future and he will bring me glory. That's Jesus. He will bring Jesus glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So two big things at the end here is every single time that you sit down and you're reading your Bible and you feel lost, the Holy Spirit is there with you explaining Jesus' words to you. Amen. Like we talked last week about how to interpret scripture and I talked about descriptive versus prescriptive and, and, and some of you guys were just totally glazed over with that and, and, and feeling kind of lost. Here's the thing, it's okay. You have the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, you do not need a seminary degree because you have the Holy Spirit. Amen. You open up Jesus' words and we're all a bit hopeless with that. We need the spirit of God to explain it to us. And when he explains it to us, he will only ever put the spotlight on Jesus. And that's kind of a weird thing. If you're like me, like you go through all of this stuff and you're like, I, I was, and I mentioned this earlier, I've given Jesus the credit for all this stuff. Or I've given the father the credit for all this stuff. Or on my really bad days, I've given myself the credit for all this stuff. but it was the spirit that was doing it all along. And it's okay because he's got this way of constantly putting the spotlight on somebody else and his name's Jesus. And he's not really picky about getting glory for himself. That's just part of the personality of the Holy Spirit. And I love that about him. It's one of the things I really like about him, right? He's just, he's diverting. Maybe today you need to grow in your gratitude for what God has done in filling you with himself. Maybe today you need to blown, be blown away all over again by the fact that through our own uh, value, performance, track record, we are not worthy to be filled with God, but we are filled with God because he's given that to us, amen? amen? I think that should blow us away. Why don't you guys stand and we'll pray. Oh, great counselor, we need your counsel. Oh, great helper, we need your help. Breath of God, we need a fresh wind to blow through our church and through our city. Holy Spirit, thank you, God, for filling us. Help us to wake up and to notice you. Um, help us to love you afresh. God, come and fill us in Christ's name. Amen.